Okay, guys, welcome. Today we're going to talk about inverse functions. Uh, so what I plan to be able to do is uh, we'll talk about what type of functions have inverses and when there is an inverse, how do we find what the inverse is. Uh, we'll also talk about how we can use composition of functions to show that it inverse is correct. And we'll also talk about how to find the domain and range of an inverse function. Okay, so first we're gonna sort of build up to the idea of what we mean by an inverse function, all right? So for example, we're going to be given this function f of x is equal to three x, all right? Now part A is asking for an x value such that f of x is equal to six. So what that means is that if f of x is equal to six, that means that three x is equal to six. Right, so now of course, how do we get an x value that makes this happen? Well, we just solve for x. So then we could divide both sides by three. And of course, that's gonna give you that x is equal to two. Okay, in part B, we wanna do something similar, except we wanna find x such that f of x is 300. So we want, again, f of x to be 300. And then that means that three X is equal to 300. So then if we divide by three again, we get that X is 100, right? And now for part C, it says for each number Y, find a number X such that F of X is equal to Y, right? Well, again, this time we're just sort of solving it in general we have f of x is equal to y, that means that we have three x is equal to y. And if we solve for x, we get that x is equal to y over three. All right, which essentially just means that if we wanted to find the x value that got us that y value, we would just divide that y, y value by three, right? And of course that would indicate that you're undoing that multiplication by three in the original function. Okay, now this is sort of, Again, building up to the idea of what we mean by the inverse function, all right? So in example two, they're giving us the function that allows us to convert from uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius, right? Um, actually, I think this function is taking us from Celsius to Fahrenheit, right? And you can always sort of check by, you know that uh, in Celsius, the temperature of freezing is zero degrees. And of course in Fahrenheit, we know that freezing is 32 degrees. Right, so to check which one you're using, just plug in zero and see if you get 32, right? So in this case, since if I plug in X equals zero, Y is equal to 32, that means that this is the Celsius scale. Celsius, that means that this takes from Celsius to Fahrenheit. All right, so we're being given 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So what they really are telling us is they're really telling us that Y is equal to 95 and we need to find X. Right, and by Y I also mean F of X. So we could then say that 95, oops, 95 is equal to nine over five times X plus 32. So to convert this, we need to subtract 32. And let's see, so we'll get a 63 is equal to nine over five times X. And then of course, to get rid of the fraction, we can multiply both sides by the reciprocal, right? So here the nine and the five cancel out and we get that X is equal to five over nine times 63. And you can do a little bit of simplifying here because you know that 63 divided by nine is seven. So you get that X is five times seven or 35 here. All right, and again, so to get there, we subtracted two, uh, 32 and then multiplied by five over nine, 
right? So now again, in part B, they want us to do something similar where for any Y value, how do we get this? How do we get the at any particular Y value, right? So what we need to do is we do what we did before. We subtract 32. So we get that Y minus 32 is nine over five times X. And then the last thing we do is we multiply both sides by five over nine. So we get that X is five over nine times Y minus 32. All right, and that allows us to get uh, the corresponding Celsius temperature for a given Fahrenheit temperature, right? And of course you could always check that when Y is 32, you do get that X is equal to zero. Right, so that's always one way you can check that. Okay, so before we talk about inverse functions explicitly, we need to talk about something that's called a one-to-one -one function, right? Now, a one-to-one -one function is a function where you have for each y in the range, there's exactly one x value, right? So you need a function to be one-to-one -one in order to have an inverse. If a function is not one-to-one, -one, it does not have an inverse, all right? And I wanna show you an example of what I mean by a one-to-one -one function. So a one-to-one -one function, let's see, could be something like three X plus two, right? And this is because if you solve for X, you get one value. Right, so you could sort of take y equals three x plus two, and you could subtract two from both sides. You get y minus two equals three x, and you divide by three, and you get x is equal to y minus two over three, and that's one value, right? But if you have something like f of x is equal to x squared, well then you have y is equal to x squared, and if you solve for x, you would need a square root both sides and you get the x's plus or minus square root of y, right? So this is not one-to-one. -one. Because if you solve for x, you get more than one value, right? And that's a problem. Okay, so if we have that a function is one-to-one, -one, then what we can do is sort of find for a given y value, if y is in the range, then we can find a function f inverse of y, and that will get us the x value that brings you to that y value, all right? And it turns out that that f inverse function is called the inverse function, right? And that just means that, notice that f of x equals y sort of means that x goes to y, and if you have f inverse of y equaling x, that is like taking a y and going back to the x that got you there. All right, so sort of notice the difference there. Okay, so now we can talk about how to find an inverse, and I really should have a step zero in here. All right, and what is the step zero? I should make sure that f is one to one. Right, and there's two ways you could do that. You could either solve for x, see if you get one y value, or you can graph and use the horizontal line test, which is the vertical line test, except you would just do the same thing, but with a horizontal line and use horizontal line test. Okay, but then once you have that it's one-to-one, -one, you then replace f of x with y, you switch x and y, solve for y, and then replace y with f inverse of x at the end. Okay, let's, so let's look at an example of this. So first we wanna evaluate f inverse of negative 11, 
All right, but what does that mean if I want to find f inverse of 11? That really means I want to find x such that f of x, which is 2x plus 3, oops, f of x, which is 2x plus 3, gives me 11. So I want to find the x value that makes that true. That makes that true. So if I solve 11 is 2x plus 3, I would do that by subtracting 3. And I get an 8 is equal to 2x. And if I divide by 2, that gives me that x is equal to 4. All right. Now we want to find a formula for the inverse. All right. So to do that, I should first check that it's one to one. All right. And if I want to do that, I can replace f of x with y and try solving it for x and see if I get one answer. And of course we will, because if I subtract 3, I get y minus 3 is equal to 2x. So x is equal to y minus 3 over 2. And I don't have any pluses or minuses or anything like that. So this is good. So one value. So this is 1 to 1. Okay. Now, to find the inverse, I'm going to first replace f of x with y. And then my second step is I now want to switch my y's to x's and my x's to y's. So I have x is equal to 2y plus 3 now. And now I want to solve this equation for y. And of course, you're going to get the same thing as before, right? You subtract three and you get x minus three is equal to two y and then divide by two and you get y is equal to x minus three over two. All right, and then, so this is sort of step three was solving for y there. And then step four is you just replace y with f inverse. So this is y sorry, f inverse of x is equal to x minus three over two, right? Or you could even say f inverse of y is equal to y minus three over two, right? This book usually likes to keep this as y notation because you're going back to sort of the x value when you do the inverse, all right? But both of, both of these would be considered good. Okay, so that's the idea. Now let's look at f of x is equal to 4x plus 5 over 2x plus 3. All right. Now I'll talk about how you could sort of verify that this is uh, one to one in a second, but I'm going to also assume f is one to one. Okay. So what do we do? Well, first, I replace f of x with y. So I have y is equal to 4x plus 5 over 2x plus 3. Then I'm going to switch x and y. So this is now an x. I have a y up here and a y down here. And then I have 4y plus 5 and 2y plus 3. So now we need to solve this thing for y. Or in other words, get y by itself. So the first thing we'll do is we'll get rid of the fraction and we'll multiply both sides by 2y plus 3. Okay, so now I have a 2y plus 3 times x is equal to, and then on this side they just cancel and I'm left with 4y plus 5. All right, now on the left side, we can distribute. So I get a 2xy plus 3x is equal to 4y plus 5. All right, now you might think, well, how about I move this 5 over and then divide by 4? All right, but the problem is that you still have a y here. So we need to be a little bit more clever than that. All right, so let me, maybe it's better to erase. All right, so we, what, 
what we actually want to do is get all of, all of our y terms to one side and every other thing to the other side. So let's go ahead and let's maybe move this 2xy term to this side. And we'll subtract five from both sides. I'm just gonna do that all in one shot. All right, so they cancel on this side and these cancel on this side. So on the left side, I have a three X minus five. And then on the right, I have a four Y minus two X Y. Now both of these terms have a Y in it. So I could write this right side as Y times something. And that's sort of the strategy here. Now, what would I need to multiply y by to get 4y? Well, I would need a 4. What would I need to multiply y by to get minus 2xy? I need a minus 2x. All right. So now all that remains to be done is just divide both sides by 4 minus 2x. And then we would get that y, I'm just going to put this on the left side now, y is equal to 3x minus 5 over four minus two X, right? So then what's the inverse? You could say that it's F inverse of X is equal to three X minus five over four minus two X. Or you could say, if you, you wanna sort of keep it with the book style, F inverse of Y is three Y minus five over four minus two Y. Either one of those would be good. All right, so that's the idea. Now, if we have that f is a one-to-one -one function, what really happened, right? Well, in f of x, we get that that's equal to y. That's equivalent to saying that if we have an inverse, that f inverse of y is equal to x, right? So you're seeing that in the inverse function, sorry, in the original function, x is going in and y is coming out, right? But in the inverse, y is going in and x is coming out, all right? So what's really happening there, remember, your x values or your values going into the function are your domain, and your values coming out of a function are the range, right? So since with the inverse that switches, you get that the domain of the inverse is the range of the original, and that the range of the inverse is the domain of the original. All right, so you get that sort of flip-flop happening there. Okay, so just as an example here, we're gonna suppose that the domain of F is the interval zero to two, and F defined on this domain is F of X squared. All right, so first of all, what's the range of F? Well, if the domain is zero to two, then f of everything in zero to two is what's everything in zero to two squared. All right, this is kind of maybe an abusive notation, but the idea here is that if I take every number inside zero to two, I'm gonna capture everything between zero to four when I square it, right? Because if I square zero, that's still my smallest value. If I square two, that's still my biggest value, so my new lowest value is zero, my new lowest value is four, all right? Now, if I wanna find a formula for the inverse of F, right, well then I replace F with Y, and then I would need to square root both sides. Now you might be saying, well, isn't that a problem since I'm gonna get the square root of y? In this case, it's not because our domain is only positive numbers, right? So instead of the plus or minus, I just have this, just the positive one here because that's all that I have for do my domain, right? Now the domain of the inverse is the range of the original. Right, what was the range of the original function? It was zero to four. So that's my domain of the inverse. All right, what's my range of the inverse? Well, my range of the inverse, oops, range of the inverse is the domain 
of the original. And that was zero to two. All right, so that's just again highlighting that your domain and range of the original function and the inverse are sort of the, are flipped of each other. Okay, now I wanna talk about something that's sort of interesting that happens here, all right? So we're telling, we're being told that f is two x plus three. All right, we wanna find a formula for f of f inverse of x. All right, now we found this inverse earlier. We found that the inverse was what? I believe it was x minus three over two, right? So we wanna find f of f inverse of x. So let's do that. So that means that I need to take f of f inverse of x and see what happens. Well, this just means I'm gonna replace f inverse with x minus three over two. And now I need to go to my f and wherever I see x, replace it with x minus three over two. So I'm gonna get two times x minus three over two plus three. Well, these twos will cancel. And then I get x minus three plus three. So plus three and minus three cancel and I'm just left with x. All right, well, what happens if we do it the other way? What happens if we do f inverse of f? right, or f inverse of f of x. Well, first we'll replace f with two x plus three. And now I need to go to f inverse and replace x with two x plus three. All right, well, what happens here? Plus three and the minus three cancel and I get two x over two, but then those twos cancel and I just get x. So in both of these cases, I got an X. And it turns out that will happen every time when you're looking at the composition of a function and its inverse, right? So of course you need it to be one-to-one -one in order for it to have an inverse. But if it does, then F of F inverse of Y would give you Y, F inverse of F would give you X, right? So basically what's gonna happen is that the F and the F inverse essentially are gonna cancel each other out. All right, so that's the idea. Okay, now this is sort of rehashing the example that we did earlier. So we have the Celsius to Fahrenheit scale here, and then we have Fahrenheit to Celsius scale here, all right? So we want to, again, we wanna check that this is correct by taking F inverse of Y, all right? And of course, you would technically need this to work in both directions, but we'll just check F of F inverse. So if I have F of F inverse, that's F of five over nine times Y minus 32. First time we just plug in. And now I need to go to F and wherever I see X, replace it with this. So I'm gonna get nine over five times X, which is five over nine times Y minus 32. And then I need to add 32 to that. Well, the first thing that happens is that nine over five and five over nine cancel each other. So I have Y minus 32 plus 32. And of course they cancel and I'm just left with Y. All right, so we know that they are inverses of each other. Okay, now I wanna talk about a little bit of a difference in notation. You have sort of that negative one, but these three examples here are sort of slightly different, all right? Now the first one, F inverse of eight, is the actual inverse. All right, now this one, it's not critical that we find F inverse of X, we just need to find F inverse of eight, which just means we need to find the X value such that X squared minus one is equal to eight. And if we do that, I'm gonna get nine is equal to X squared. And since my domain is just positive numbers, that means when I square root, I just want positive three. 
all right? Now in part B, we want to find f of 8 to the negative 1, all right? Now what does it mean to be a negative exponent? It means that if it's in the numerator, we need to put it in the bottom in order to get this to be a positive exponent. So now it has an exponent of positive 1, but that's just 1 over f of 8. All right, so what is f of eight? That means I need to plug in eight into my original f now, so 64, which is eight squared minus one. So this is gonna be one over 63. All right, so a very different answer from part A. And part C is even more different because we have f of eight to the negative one, but this is f, what is eight to the negative one? It's one over eight. So this means go to f, and I'm replacing my x with a 1 over 8. So this is a 1 over 64 minus 1, which is like 1 over 64 minus 64 over 64, so negative 63 over 64. All right, so just be aware of that different notation. We reserve f to the negative one of eight for the inverse. And then if you have the inverse sort of around the whole thing, we mean the reciprocal of f of eight. And if it's just toward the eight, we mean f times the reciprocal of eight, right? So just be aware of those, those different notations there. Okay, so the next example, we're supposing that we run a marathon which is 26.2 miles in exactly four hours. So we're gonna let f be the function with domain zero to 26.2, such that f of d is the number of minutes since the start of the race at which you reached uh, a distance of d miles from the starting line. So of course, now the range of f, so f of d is number of minutes past um, after traveling D miles. All right, so now what is the range of F? Well, the range of F, right, is the possible Y values. And since this ended, this was exactly four hours. All right. But my function is given in minutes, so I need to do four times 60 to get this in minutes. I get 240 minutes, All right? So the range is zero to 240. All right, because those are my possible Y values, my possible times. Now for B, we wanna know what's the domain of the inverse. would of course be the range of the original, and that's zero to 240. All right, so now if you can sort of see the connection here, we wanna know what is the meaning of F inverse of T for a number T in the domain of F inverse. F inverse of T would sort of switch the units before, right? In this original one, we had distance going in and time coming out. So in F inverse, we'd have time going in and distance coming out, right? And that should make sense because this zero to 240 corresponds to the time. So this function, if you found the inverse, you would say, this is how many minutes I've ran. And then what would come out is how far you've traveled, right? So that's a nice application of inverse functions. All right, so that concludes this video on inverse functions. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time.